a bit different, I'm sure, for you. And uh, I hope that if you're watching this video, I am in Michigan uh, attending my in-laws church. The alternatives to doing that are not as pleasant, I'm sure. So uh, I miss being with you guys today. Uh, but I thought it, this was significant, a lesson for me to take some time and try to record this for you uh, this morning. So hopefully you're excited about the title of this lesson, Grace for a Parent's Heart. And uh, I'm excited about sharing it with you. Uh, it's interesting how uh, over the last, uh, this last year I've taught uh, some different classes. I taught one called uh, How People Change. And in it... God just revealed to me my selfishness, how selfish I am, how much I really want to live for myself. And then I began studying for this class, and in these first three lessons, you know, as we learn about uh, our authority and how we need to be uh, God's authority in our home and God's authority to our kids, and I just saw how oftentimes I live for myself and not even take into account God's authority. And then as I thought about as well, the second lesson we had with, with Gospel Centered Hope, I was just like, oh yeah, I, uh, I off the expectations for my kids are often just my own selfish heart being expressed. And then last week's was kind of like the, uh, the death blow to my selfishness as we thought through disciplining a parent's heart. And uh, as I read through that, I remember being very confronted with the fact that that I live for myself so much, whether it's my impatience or my, my anger, how I deal with my kids, it just demonstrates the selfishness of my heart. And I was at this point studying for this class, and I was just overwhelmed by the sinfulness of my own heart. And in God's wisdom, our uh, lesson plan came uh, to this lesson, grace for a parent's heart. And it was exciting to me. Uh, to come to this and to be confronted with this because it's what I needed then and I, and I think it's what you all need as well today to hear. And so um, as we move into this, just, just open up your heart to receive the grace of God in this because the principle we have for today is trying to be a good parent will crush you if you don't embrace grace. And that is so true. I felt the weight of my sin coming down on me as I plan these lessons, as I study for these lessons, and uh, as I began to think about grace, I just hope just filled my heart. Uh, so this morning we want to impart that hope to each other as we walk through this. Uh, the first point under this principle of trying to be a good parent will crush us if we don't embrace grace is that gospel-centered parody matters. There's a reason why weight is attached to the subject. You know, we, we look through Scripture and we see our responsibility to teach. We look through Scripture and we see our responsibility to, to instruct our children in the ways of God. And that's a huge weight on us. We, uh, we think about the fact that there are kids, how much we love them, how much we care for them, how much we want their good and desire their best. We look through Scripture and we see that parenting in this way, this gospel-centered parenting that we're trying to understand, we're trying to learn, is a means of pleasing God. And, uh, and as Christians, that should be the core of, of the motivation of everything that we do, that we want God to be glorified and we want to see Him honored and pleased with our life. And so gospel-centered parenting matters. It should matter to us. It should make a difference to us. It should change us. And so that weight is rightly placed upon us. But with that weight comes guilt. You see, parenting often comes with guilt. As I thought through the lessons I was doing in my own selfishness, I realized how much I had let my children down. I let them down through my own weaknesses, my own impatience with them, my own anger towards them. Sometimes I let them down with my, my laziness, 
my lack of discipline. I'd say we're going to do this as a family and then we wouldn't do it. We're going to read together as a family or we're going to pray together as a family. And there's days when I was lazy. I lacked the discipline to follow through on the good intentions that I had. And they observed it and I let them down in it. I often have wrong priorities, whether it's I want to watch this TV show right now or I want to play this game right now or I, I want to see this sports show right now or I want to read this section of my book right now. Sometimes I have wrong priorities and miss out on the opportunities to teach them, to instruct them in everyday life. Because my life said certain things are more important. Sometimes it was just my sheer selfishness. I wanted to do what pleased me. I'd come home and I just want to do what makes me happy undermine the authority of God. And so parenting often comes with guilt. I'm sure you could each tell your own story of the guilt that you feel as you think about how you may have let down your children. You know what? Though, God's Word speaks to us about our guilt. What we do with guilt tells us what we really believe about the Gospel. What we do with our guilt tells us what we really believe about the gospel. Ironically, it's interesting that as uh, we think through this, the writer of this lesson said that giving the true picture of God's forgiveness can make us feel guilty. And he was just amazed by the irony of that. We're, we're trying to picture for our children God's forgiveness, the gospel that he's given to us, the grace that we have. Yet we see how ineffective we are in presenting that to them. And that produces guilt within us. And the more condemned we feel, the more pressure we get from that guilt, the less we communicate His grace. The less we give the grace of God to our kids. And then the more condemned we feel, then less grace and more condemnation. I'm not... I'm not communicating it like I should, and now I feel more condemnation and more guilt. What's the answer? The answer is that for us to communicate grace to our kids, we've got to begin by communicating grace to our own hearts. When we first communicate grace to our own hearts, then we can effectively communicate grace to our kids before. So grace has to come. We have to preach the gospel to ourselves. The second thing about this principle here that we're learning today is this. The essence of the gospel is that God accepts us because of what Jesus did, not because of what we did. The essence of the gospel is that God accepts us because of what Jesus did, not because of what we did. We're going to look at Romans chapter 5, familiar verses probably to you, but go ahead and turn there. Romans chapter 5, I'll give you a minute to get there, and we're going to look at a few verses here in Romans chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 6, and we're going to work our way down to verse 10. Verse 6 says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. You see, through there, we were weak, and at the right time Christ died for the ungodly, we were still sinners. I mean, the word there's still, we were still, that's what we were at the time when he died. 
It's not like we had gotten better. It's what we were sinners. Christ dies for us. And we see there in verse 10, For if while we were enemies. Now that word while is so important there. Because it tells us that's, that's what we were at that time. Enemies of God. Saying we didn't do anything. We were weak, too weak to save ourselves. We were sinners. We, we were doing the very things that condemned us. And then on top of that, we were enemies. We were against the very thing that saves us. We we're antagonistic to it. The essence of the gospel is that God accepts us because of what Jesus did. Not because of us, because we were weak, we were sinners, we were enemies. And Jesus dies. Jesus sheds his blood. Jesus takes our place. And, and that's the whole idea of, of Luke 18. And Jesus is asking the Pharisees, who leaves approved by God? And it's not the Pharisee praising himself. Rather, it's the tax collector who doesn't. The tax collector who begs for God's mercy. You see, earning forgiveness, if that's what we desire to do, to earn it of ourselves, equals a denial of God's grace. It denies the very grace we desperately need for our forgiveness. We can't earn. We could only accept what has done, been done for us through Jesus Christ. And so the gospel presents us with the liberating discovery that we're sinners. That's what we are, sinners. And it should be liberating for us to understand that fact. Because it, it, It's not as if that fact alone liberates us. But the fact that in being sinners, God has given a remedy, a hope, a means of being made right with him. It's sinners that Jesus came to die for. Jesus didn't come to heal the, the, those who thought they were well, but rather the sick. He came for sinners. And so it's liberating to us as the gospel presents us with this truth that we are sinners. And it's interesting as we think about our families we're a bunch of sinners thrown into a family unit together to live together. Some of us in tighter places than others, mind you. I know how that is. And, uh, you know, you live in an RV for a little while and you really know you're sinners. <laughs> so, but, but you got sinners thrown into families together and what does that equal? That equals friction, that equals more sin. I mean, you get sinners sinning against sinners against sinners, and you just got tons of sin going on. And as we seek to understand that, we have to caution our own hearts. We have a tendency as we begin to understand and see the sinfulness, but yet not recognize the sinfulness of our heart to parent in a very legalistic way, which, which makes... Uh, it all about the rules. Um, that the gospel is just a matter of rules that we're to follow. It's not. And yet, sometimes when we don't, we aren't liberated by the gospel to recognize that we too are sinners. We can we can kind of lay that upon our kids, and, and sometimes we can lay it upon ourselves. Or we can practice license, which basically states that God's rules don't matter. One is the gospel is just a matter of rules, and the other one says that God's rules don't matter. And it's hard to see grace in that. Because what difference does it make if I'm a sinner or not? It does make a difference. It does make a difference when we recognize we're sinners, because then we truly see our great need of grace. And if we don't recognize how sinful we are and that we can't keep the rules no matter how hard we try, we don't run to grace either. You see, we need to understand that the gospel presents us with the liberating truth that we're sinners. And the gospel answers the need of sinners. 
and not make it hard for ourselves and for our kids to see the grace that is there for them. Our kids need to see the gospel and that it matters. They need to see it in us because we recognize our own sin. We recognize how sinful we as their parents are. And we recognize how sinful they as our kids are. And together we run to grace. The gospel matters to us. You see, perfection will crush you. But grace brings rest. And that's so true as a parent. I confess, I am a perfectionist in many areas. Not as many as my wife would want me to be in, but uh, many areas I am. And it is true. It will crush you. But grace brings rest. Grace does. You know, as I thought back about my kids, and I praise God that, that they've been saved by Him, but... Oh, how I desire for them to be saved. And yet, I fought my own heart because I, I didn't want them to just parrot my own words and mimic me and say, Jesus is great because I said it. Now, I wanted them to hear me say it because I want them to know that Jesus is great to me. But ultimately, I wanted to see a work of God in their life. And so I would share the gospel and, and I wouldn't force them to pray any prayers or say anything. I just wanted them to see that the gospel was necessary for me as a sinner. And the gospel is necessary for them as a sinner too. And our kids are only saved by grace. If God wants us to be a good witness, and that's what I was striving to be. But in the end, our kids are saved by grace, and I have to rest in the grace of God. There's nowhere else in this world to rest. If I try to do it all on my own, I can't. I can't. I have to rest in the grace of God. To be a good witness, he's called me to be. And know that he will save those whom he wants to save. At times, I wasn't the best of witnesses. I'm sure you can relate to that fact. Where the anger gets the better of you. Or your impatience gets the better of you. Or uh, your sinfulness, your selfishness. And maybe it's not just with your kids, but they see it with your wife as well. Or your husband as well. They see it when you talk about other people in the church. They see it when you put other things before the church. Before the word. Before God. What do we do when we feel condemned? Brother and sister, run to grace. Run to grace. When you have been a terrible witness to your spouse, to your kids, run to grace. Turn to 1 John 1. In 1 John 1, we have this hope for us. It's very encouraging. But we need to run to grace. Familiar passage in verse 9, but before we get to verse 9, let's, let's read, uh, let's start in verse 5 and read down. This is the message that we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sins. Lest you think that that walking in the life was all from your own doing. John wisely places in here, it's the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all our sins. He goes on to say, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. You see... There's a liberating aspect to discovering that we're sinners, to admitting that we're sinners in need of grace. Because there's the blood of Jesus Christ who covers our sins, 
cleanses us from sins. And based upon that cleansing, he goes on to say, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Run to grace and repentance and in faith. Run in the grace confessing our sins to God. Yes, I did this. It was wrong. Please forgive me. And in faith we believe that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. And we don't have to live condemned. We don't have to fear God and His wrath. But rather, our, our fear of God should drive us to repentance. And our faith in God should see His love being poured out upon us through the work of His Son on the cross. And that we are forgiven. And if we live in that, that running to grace and repentance and faith, if we live in that, brothers and sisters, we can parent our children. We can parent them with the gospel. We can have a gospel-centered family and gospel-centered homes. If we continue to hold the gospel firmly and preach it to our own hearts first and then to theirs. Brothers and sisters, I miss being with you. I hope that this video has been encouragement. This lesson has been encouragement to your heart as it has been to mine. You're in my prayers.